Last episode, we talked about all the abilities that came from Shalter's vampiric side, including her original berserker-like form. But this time, we're going to talk about her remaining classes, and every single one of her known spells, skills, and abilities. As much as I'd love to talk about her divine equipment too, there's simply too much info on that to fit into this video. So let's take a look at what else went into Shaltir's build to classify her as one of the strongest 1v1 fighters in Nazarick. But first, don't forget you can get your Pleiades, Succubae, or Nabe merch from the links in the description. Now, let's begin. If you look closely at Shaltir's classes, there isn't really a consistent theme going on. They just seem to be a random assortment that was picked out for their powerful and useful abilities, as well as synergistic aspects with her overall build. As you may recall, only 20 levels were dedicated to the heteromorphic specific racial classes, those being her vampire levels. The other 80 were devoted to her job classes, and though most of them are unknown, we do know a few thanks to her stat card. Specifically, she has 10 levels in Cleric, 5 in Cursed Knight, 5 in Valkyrie Lance, then an unknown amount in one called Blood Drinker leaving approximately 60 levels unaccounted for. From these few though, it's clear she's got a mixed blend of both warrior and caster classes, which would normally result in a mediocre build since spreading herself too thin across too many roles typically isn't very ideal. But it would seem that Pararonchino found a way to get the best of both worlds, and we'll look into that real soon. We've already discussed a lot about clerics. They worship a deity and in turn that deity powers their magic. For Shaltir, you'd assume that she'd worship the Supreme Ones as her god, since, well, they created her. Like she might pray to Ainz or Pararonchino, but that's actually not the case. It's not like the guild members wrote in each of the NPCs' bios that they must be revered as gods. No, as a matter of fact, Pararonchino picked a random vampire-esque raid boss named Cannibal as the deity for Shaltir to worship, which she wasn't too impressed by considering it was a monster that was slain by the Supreme Ones. In any case, that being her designated deity means she's likely an evil type cleric, one that channels negative energy, meaning that all her negative energy spells would not only be effective at damaging living opponents, but also healing herself and any other undead in the area. But before we get into what exactly those spells are, it's best that you first understand the two main types into which they're categorized. Depending on the nature of a spell, it can be either arcane or divine though it's not like there was a distinct line between the two. Many spells are available to both arcane and divine spellcasters, reason being that the main difference between these two categories are the root of where the power came from. Arcane spells are typically acquired through study and involve using mana to shift the fabric of reality. Their potential effects are practically unlimited and usually quite flashy. They include shooting fireballs, creating illusions, animating golems, and everything else in between. Divine spells, on the other hand, are normally acquired through communion with a higher power, aka a deity. Which, as you now know in Overlord, even if that deity doesn't exist, merely having faith in something higher up is sufficient to give the ability to cast divine spells. These tend to be more subtle and include things like buffs, healing, and utility, or holy, dark, and fire spells, thus giving undead clerics a significant advantage when fighting against other undead creatures. We see many of these aspects reflected in Shaltir's spell selection which is quite immense and most certainly stems from other spellcasting classes that weren't identified earlier. And since Overlord's tier magic system pretty much directly parallels the magic in Dungeons and Dragons, we can confidently describe and rank each of her spells, as they're essentially carbon copies of each other. The only thing that Overlord does differently is the addition of that 10th and super tier. You know, just to add that extra OP factor. But by relating it to Dungeons & Dragons, it will also help us associate a potential class to each of the spells, giving us a much better idea on what other classes Shaltir's build might entail. So let's go through each of them one by one. Brilliant Radiance, approximately 8th tier. You know the spell Smite in League of Legends? Yeah, it's pretty much that. A spell that calls down a holy power from the heavens to smite the enemy, dealing significant damage to most undead and targets that are weak to holy but also does no damage to targets that are aligned with good, and only half to those that are neutral. In Shaltir's case, she tends to use this as one of her main damage spells, alongside the 9th tier Vermilion Nova spell, this being a targetable spell that hits the enemy with a very large pillar of flame, most likely as a higher tiered version of your typical flame strike spell. Force Explosion Ranking approximately at the 7th tier, it creates a shockwave of force in a specific direction, Think of a force push from Star Wars. It can push enemies or objects away, and even block projectiles or certain spells if timed correctly. 
we see Shelter use it to break Ainz's Wall of Skeleton. In a similar strain of spells, there's the 7th tier Force Sanctuary, a defensive one that creates a circular barrier of pure force around the caster that's manifested as a white light and blocks all attacks, both physical and magical. It essentially made the caster immune to most forms of magic, as the barrier was invulnerable while active, but at the same time, you're unable to attack while within. Of course, as it is with any barrier, sure it can block any attack, but after taking so much damage, it will disappear. Gate, a high-ranking utility spell that creates a large portal linking one destination to another, allowing for the instant transportation of any number of people so long as the portal remains open. In order for teleportation spells like this to work, the caster must have a very good idea of the destination in mind, either having been there personally or using another means to visualize it, such as scouting through magic or looking at a detailed image. Similarly, the 7th tier spell, Greater Teleportation, can teleport either the caster or a single target they're in contact with over an infinite distance with zero chance of failure, meaning 100% teleportation accuracy. You see, regular teleportation had a chance of misfiring and sticking the caster in a completely different destination than intended. And such risks increased when the caster was less familiar with the destination, because once again, the caster needed to be able to properly envision the destination in their mind before teleporting. Greater Lethal a very high-ranking spell that deals a significant amount of negative energy to a single target, meaning it could act as a powerful healing spell for undead or a damage spell against living creatures. It seems to function identically to the divine spell from Dungeons and Dragons known as Inflict Wounds. This came in five variants of increasing potency, Inflict Light, Moderate, Serious, and Critical Wounds, then a final variant simply called Harm. If we had to guess, Greater Lethal would be an upgraded version of Harm, and Harm basically dealt a significant flat set of damage that scaled with the level of the caster, so it's likely that Greater Lethal acted this way as well. Implosion Ah, one of my personal favorites. Have you ever wondered what would happen if you spawned a black hole inside of someone? No? Just me? Oh, okay. Well, Implosion is pretty much that, a 10th tier spell that causes the bodies of multiple creatures to collapse in on themselves. As much as you'd think that this would one-shot just about anything, those with enough physical resistances can fend off this attack. So it's more useful as a tool to mass annihilate weak enemies. We actually see Shelter use it back in Season 1 when she's fighting some of the bandits. Switching back to some more utility now, we have Invisibility, a low-level spell that does as the name states. It makes a target or yourself invisible for a specific period of time, or after performing an action that will notify someone else of your presence. There are various counters to this, such as rogue or rangers who can spot signs of invisible creatures without using magic, as well as the fact that it only blocks out vision and not sound. There are stronger variants though, such as complete invisibility and perfect unknowing, which both eliminate all traces of the target. Of course, she can also combine invisibility with silence to increase her stealth without using a high tier spell. Silence is only at the second level, and it completely eliminates sound over a defined area. Not only is it useful for sneaking around, but if you increase the target area to encompass your current battlefield, you could prevent casters from successfully using spells that require speech to be activated. Though that technique is only effective in the New World, since Yggdrasil didn't make it necessary to shout the name of your spell when casting it. Another low-level utility spell is Life Essence, which allows the caster to inspect an ally or enemy target's HP, though it can easily be countered with the spell False Data Life. This makes the Life Essence reading inaccurate, by displaying a fake HP value instead of their actual health. Shelter also has Mana Essence, which pretty much does the same thing except for mana instead of HP, and once again, it can be countered with False Data Mana. Now, as far as utility goes, those last few aren't very powerful, but what is, is the spell known as Destroy Magic. In D&D, there are magic negating spells known as Dispel Magic and Greater Dispel Magic, but Destroy Magic is an even more powerful version of those, placing it around the 9th tier. And what it does is basically cancels out any ongoing effects of other magic. It could be an animated golem, a summon, a force field, pretty much anything that is active because of magic can be negated by this spell. Though the probability that Destroy Magic is successful is dependent on both the caster's level and the level of the spell that they're trying to destroy. As you'd expect, the stronger you are as a caster, the more likely it is for Destroy Magic to be successful. Then there's her summoning spells. We've already discussed her summon household ability. 
but she also has the Raise Kin skill and the 10th tier Summon Monster spell. Summon Monster is the highest level of summoning magic, and is capable of creating the strongest creatures. You can expect their levels to be around 70 to 85, and presumably, the caster can choose from a wide selection of creatures to summon, though certain spellcasters can specialize in specific types of creatures. So, we've been through damage spells, healing spells, a whole bunch of utility, and now summons. How about we mix in some of her time magic now? Time Accelerator. This speeds up time relative to your opponent, which in turn lets you move at unnatural speeds while everything around you slows to a crawl. Of course, it has been mentioned that certain magic abilities and items can render one immune to the relativity effects of time magic. In such cases, these individuals aren't slowed down or stopped and can continue to move at the same speeds as the caster. Overall, Time Accelerator seems to be a slightly weaker version of the 10th tier arcane spell Time Stop. This one's slowing your opponent down by such a significant amount that they appear practically immobile. It still allows for limited movement, but much, much less than what Time Accelerator does. Now you'd think that spells such as these have some strange effects on the functionality of the world itself, and you'd be right. You see, a time manipulation actually prevents cause and effect from functioning properly during its duration. Spells and attacks that occur during a time stop don't affect enemies at all. Instead, if they were to affect a target, the caster would have to time the casting of their spells so that their effects are synchronized to take place the instant the time spell ends. So it's not like time manipulation was some extremely OP, uncounterable move. It likely required a high level of skill in-game experience and knowledge to successfully pull off a combo that made the most of these spells. Finally, Shaltir has Wall of Stone. It's literally a barrier made of stone and is mostly used to protect against physical attacks. While we know that Shaltir uses it to encircle herself in a protective barrier, Yggdrasil was said to have a complicated system allowing spellcasters to specify properties such as distance and area of effect for spells like these, giving the user a lot of flexibility with regards to their spell usage. But yeah, that's every spell Shaltir is known or suspected to have, either because she's casted it before or claimed to know it. It's unclear which comes from which class, but it's likely that a lot stem from her other unknown spellcasting classes, most notably the ones that don't involve teleportation, time manipulation, mind control, and force magic. As for the classes that we do know, well, let's take a closer look at each. Starting with Blood Drinker, though we don't know how many levels she has in it, we do know its primary ability is Blood Pool. As Shaltir kills her targets, she can collect their blood in an orb that would hover by her side. This blood can then be used for many things, most notable of which was a source of mana to cast spells with, which would definitely be an essential tool to spellcasters, though I suspect not every spellcaster had access to it. Perhaps only races that bet upon their opponents or drank their blood had access to this Blood Drinker class. Then she has her 5 levels in Cursed Knight, which may sound similar to something like a Black Knight or an Evil Paladin, but Cursed refers to something much more significant. After all, supernatural afflictions like lycanthropy and vampirism are frequently referred to as curses, so perhaps a Cursed Knight is only available to warrior classes like those. Regardless, we see the effects of this curse during the Hideout Raid, as one of the bandits tries to impale her with a broadsword, Shaltir plucks it out and grips it as if about to swing it, but instead, it rusts away almost instantly. That's not to say that she can't use all weapons, because she does have her spirit lance, so maybe it's just low level and non-magical ones that she can't use. Anyway, a potential class ability that stems from this one is her impure shockwave shield, this creating an expanding barrier that pushes away enemies and attacks from all directions, acting as both an offensive and defensive ability though it can only be used up to three times per day. It falls in line with the high survivability and defensive capabilities of similarly styled Paladin and Black Knight class abilities, but it's the word impure that suggests its power is derived from something dark and sinister, like a curse. One thing to keep in mind though is that Cursed Knight sounds much more like a warrior than a caster, so it's possible this specific ability stemmed from a similar class known as Cursed Caster, which is actually one that she's known to possess in the web novels. Another useful aspect that is potentially from these cursed classes could be the ability to inflict a cursed wound. You see, the wearer of the world item that mind-controlled Shaltir, Lady Care, had grown extremely sick after the battle. 
She became a victim of a mysterious curse that the slain theocracy didn't recognize and couldn't heal with ordinary magic. This ultimately led to her death a few months later. Given what had happened during the battle, it's not unlikely that Lady Care became a victim of a debilitating magic disease from Shaltair's attack. After effects such as these could likely only be removed from someone with around the same power as Shaltier, which basically meant that Lady Care was screwed no matter what. So it's definitely a potent tool to have in Shaltier's arsenal, especially when facing off against lesser beings, which is pretty much all the time. To close things off, we have Shaltier's final known class called Valkyrie Lance. In Norse mythology, a Valkyrie was a spirit and servant of the god Odin. Their name means chooser of the slain and their job was to prepare for Odin an army of valiant dead warriors for the day of Ragnarok, which if you didn't already know, referred to the end of the world. They were present at every battle, picking out the best of the slain warriors to gain entry into Valhalla and become what's known as Inherliar. Depending on where you look, they could be portrayed as noble maidens or bloodthirsty executioners, with entertainment media tending to stick to the latter. I'm sure you're familiar with the idea of these armored female warriors gloriously riding their horses into battle with spear in hand. So in that regard, they're typically warrior spirits with some magical powers that can influence the dead. But when talking about Yggdrasil, a Valkyrie Lance is just a specialized variant of the base Valkyrie class, with different specializations existing for different weapon types. That's not to say that specializations are limited to physical weapons only. There could be a whole Valkyrie class tree dedicated to both spell type and weapon specializations, but for Shaltir's specific type of Valkyrie Lance, it's possible the requirements were for the user to be female and have some levels in a Divine Spellcaster class like Cleric and then another few in a warrior related class. Aside from having proficiency with the Lance, the most important ability that comes from this class is Inheriar. Usable only once a day, it summons an identical clone of Shaltir with the exact same stats, essentially turning any 1v1 into a 2 on 1. The clone gains any buffs and immunities that's received from currently worn gear, but it cannot use any spells or special abilities. Its form is a construct, a catch-all race for creatures whose bodies are animated by magic or technology, sort of similar to that of the Golem Gargantua or the robotic automata Shizu Delta. At its core, it's a very simple ability, but it could very well be her strongest. Think about it, it's a spell that not only adds an additional piece to the battlefield, but doubles the amount of damage that you do. In a 1v1 scenario, this would be absolutely devastating to the opponent. They now have to split their attention between two targets, deal with taking more damage, and figure out a way to defeat two identically statted enemies. So I'm sure you see now why Peronchino added the Valkyrie class to Shaltir's build. Not much else is known about the Valkyrie's capabilities, but Shaltir does have a few other abilities that I've yet to speak on. First is Spell Resistance, a pretty standard property that boosts defenses against spells. The likelihood of you nullifying the enemy's attacks was dependent either on the caster's level or the level of the spell being casted. In Shaltir's case, her resistance worked better against weaker casters. Then there's her Time Reversal ability. This can be only used three times a day, but it's extremely useful against high-powered enemies. It allows her to negate the damage of a single recent attack by literally rewinding the time around her body to reverse the effects, making it seem as if it never happened. It's not limited to damage either. You could reverse time to also get rid of debuffs and negative status effects. And finally, she has what's called a Purifying Javelin, another three use per day limited ability that fires a beam of light and deals holy damage. This was the spell that she used to strike down Lady Care. Unlike other holy attacks, its potency wasn't dependent on the user's karma. I mean, if it did, Shelter's negative 450 karma would result in the attack being only useful as a flashlight. More importantly though, she can spend a small amount of MP to make the attack have perfect accuracy and tracking ability. Yeah, Shelter has aimbot, but it's not to say the ability can't be blocked, it just won't miss. A magical force field or dodge skill like mist form can easily counter this ability, and it's not like the attack was particularly damaging either. It was more useful at long range to disrupt spellcasters that are in the distance. And that's every spell and ability that Jin4 and I could come up with. As you now know, she has just about every ability under the sun. Maybe even the sun itself with Vermilion Nova. But it's after knowing all of this that you can really appreciate the fight between Eins and Shaltir, because it's not like she didn't use her kit to its fullest extent. She played that fight very well, but just lacked a bit of knowledge and cash shop items to prepare for it. 
in that regard, Ayn's had the advantage. Anyway, that's everything that I've got for today. Part 3 will cover her equipment, as well as why exactly she's considered to be the most powerful Floor Guardian. But before I go, don't forget you can get the Pleiades, Succubae, and Nabe merch from the links in the description. Now, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!